By 1300, the saintly queens of Transalpine Gothic, this Emma of Regensburg left, had brought the chivalric to such refinement as would sweeten through Duccio, Santo, the Saint Catherine of his Maesta about 1310, as in poetry through Dante's Beatrice and Petrarch's Laura, toward the Simonetta virgins of Botticelli, right. Thus Petrarch of Laura in Paradise, God's chosen angels and his spirits blessed, tenants of heaven, when my lady died, came in sacred wonder to her side. What light is this? What glory manifest? Like Dante, Petrarch makes his lost love an intercessor. Lady in bliss, pray that I may join you. Such in Giotto's enthroned Madonna is the rapturous fusion of earth and heaven in a glorified art body. Petrarch at the last would turn from love's idolatry to Christ alone, no hope in any other, tu sai ben che in altrui non ho speranza. But what would move Wyatt, the long love that in my thought I harbor, and sorry, sweet is his death that takes his end by love, was that worship of a mortal thing. What gives the Laura sonnets their incarnate sheen as of Giotto's flower-bearing angels? It was an evocation everywhere latent in the analogies of Gothic love. Chaucer's early elegy, The Book of the Duchess, draws its bowers of Zephyrus and Flora from the French Romance of the Rose, as though the earth envy your world to be gayer than the heaven. By that suspension, as in Giotto's Christ and the Magdalene, precision floats in a mystery of suggestive mood, Chaucer's hound through the forest to the man in black that sat and had he turned his back to an oak and huge a tray. Such veiled artistry reaches its height when Petrarch by the stream hears the voice of Laura. Perhaps Simone Martini, painting in Avignon this frontispiece for a Virgil commentary owned by Petrarch, his friend, best catches its illumination of nature. If birds lament, green leaves or tendrils stir to the soft sighing of the air of summer, or through the wave wash at the petal shore of a clear stream, crystals liquid murmur sound, where I sit bowed to the forest floor, her whom heaven showed and earth now covers, I see and hear and know, as if the power of her live voice responded from afar. Why do you spend yourself before your years, she asks in pity, or wherefore and for whom pour the wasting river of your tears? You must not weep for me. My life became dying eternal, and to eternal skies the dark that seemed to close them cleared my eyes. Se lamentar argelli o verdi fronde mover suavemente a laura estiva, o rocco mormorar di lucidonde sode d'una fiorita e fresca riva, la vioseggia d'amor pensoso e scriva, le che il ciel ne mostro terra nasconde, veggio et odo et intendo, Cancor viva di si lontano a sospir miei risponde. De perché innanzi il tempo ti consume, mi dice con pietate, a che pur versi degli occhi tristi un doloroso fiume? Di me non pianger tu, che miei di versi morendo eterni, e nell'eterno lume quando mostrai di chiuder gli occhi apersi. That dawn in purgatory shimmer, as in Ambrogio Lorenzetti's Dorothy, music too marvelously parallels in the spectral equivocations Dante's friend Casella may have taught the first generation of Petrarch's time. The last page of Jacopo da Bologna's Lux exhibits the techniques, next to last bar, the double leading tone chord, G-sharp, C-sharp, E, 
the sharped G leading to A, the sharped C to D, a bitonal suspension before the bare fifth close. Such enigmatic minors under rhythmic runs with the syncopated pulses called hoketus or hiccup, bar 55 and faster in 61 and 63, stamp the whole piece with the compelling search of Ars Nova. All are illustrated in the performance of this last page. The piece, the rendition we require, could not be better exhibited than in the musicians Simone Martini paints in The Knighting of St. Martin, an expectance of gaiety in sadness, both dissolved in the bare fifth distance of the eyes, as if Devan, Archimbo, and Bonté had studied the fresco before they recorded in 1937 for Loiseau Lille. Chaucer, too, had come by Italian mediation from the timeless immersion of the Book of the Duchess to the ambivalence of Pandrus, I have a lusty woe, a jolly sorrow, the dramatic poignance of Troilus' speech to the moon, I wis, one thou art horned newe, I shall be glad if all the world be trewe. Let us hear the whole Jacobo de Bologna motet, moving from these musicians to Simone Martini's Annunciation where the intended moods, as of Mary, may never be fathomed, yet imperatively advance the question.
European culture has evolved by circulation. When Sionese Simone went to Avignon, the current of Gothic that had quickened the Italian new art flowed back to quicken the north, as Chaucer would learn from Dante, Petrarch, Boccaccio. How far that Italy inspired the Burgundian, a comparison of Taddeo Gaddi's presentation of the Virgin fresco about 1335 left with Paul de Limburg's miniature about 1415 will imply. After Giotto's massive advance, his school seems almost to lose ground, yet the imitative and softening continuance quietly confirms an observational base by which the style of 1400 all over Europe would prepare for the next great natural thrust of Masaccio and the Van Eycks. So from Gaddi, perhaps through the drawing now in the Louvre, the Giottesque livens to the Duc de Berry's Très Richelles. From this international crest, the style tide, as in music, was already returning to the Italy of Lorenzo Monaco, Gentile da Fabriano, Fra Angelico. So Two conquests seem related in music of expressive modulation, here 14th century solage, in painting of light through darkness. By the deceptive ease of words, 12th century Chrétien had told how a thousand men in search of Eric rode toward Limoges in the moonlight shining clear, as Dante later had touched the glowing mosques of Dis with prophetic chiaro scuro, red as if come from fire as you see in this low hell. But the first known art depiction is by Giotto's pupil, Taddeo Gaddi, a fresco of shepherds on the night ground, lighted by an angel glowing in the sky, to which Boccaccio's Latin eclogue, Olympia, offers a radiant parallel, when the poet's lost daughter appears as a spirit, lighting the shepherd's cottage and refulgent wood. Look. The beaches are untouched, the leaves luxuriant and hazels verdant in the flaming light. It was a magic the Renaissance would perfect, as Ockergum the noble deepening of Tessitura. Skipping Paul de Limburg's Burgundian Gethsemane, with torches and a starry sky, we reach the Italian middle term, Piero della Francesca's 1455 dream of Constantine, Vasari. Above every other consideration of skill and art is Piero's representation of night, where he depicts an angel in flight, foreshortened with his head downward, bringing the signs of victory to Constantine, who sleeps in his tent, as revealed in darkness by the angel's light. Through such imitation of nature, Vasari says, artists have reached the perfection we see today. Thus, contemporary with Josquin's motet of Christ's descent from the stars, Raphael, in the Vatican fresco of St. Peter's escape from prison, kindles on armor the gleam of torches and moon, a magic to which literature also would aspire. Spencer, 
when the Red Cross Knight goes into Arrow's darksome hole. His glistering armor made a little glooming light, much like a shade. In the cities of Italy, freed by the decline of the empire and the 1305 withdrawal of the papacy to Avignon, we seek the terms of that first clear western rush of spirit into time. At its core is the tension of new humanism and old faith. The same Simone Martini who curtained beauty in ritual gold painted in the public hall of Siena the pride of Guido Riccio an oriflamme of force against the unvalidated bare expanse of Middle Earth. The same Petrarch who gave mystery to love revived the heroic in his Latin poem Africa, was crowned laureate in Rome, wrote the first patriotic ode of the modern West, a call to Cola di Rienzo to restore the empire to honor. For you, as for no other, fate unfurls the banner of its good, immortal fame. I say you have the power to redeem the noblest state that ever ruled the world. In life as in art, this eruption of tonal vigor in the modal void prompts Petrarch's ambivalent cry, physic against fortune. There is no war worse than this, no, not civil war, for that is between factions of citizens in the streets of the cities, but this is fought within the mind, between the parts of the soul. Boccaccio also lived that strife in which the claims of heaven and earth stood almost at parity. Even his De Casibus, written as a penance for the De Camerone and to teach the vanity of earth, precurses Renaissance tragedy in its fall of the great, Farnham. The human mind has a fiery vigor, a celestial origin, an insatiable desire for glory. In Milan, the Visconti tomb mounts the mailed fist of power on the grave. In Petrarch's 1336 letter on the ascent of Mont Ventoux, the romance of man and nature, Leonardo, Goethe, Thoreau, pierces the medieval. So in the vast panorama of good government in the country, by that Sienese painter-humanist Ambrogio Lorenzetti, the dimensional table unfolds, contending against spacelessness. Of course, from the Silk Route in the Asian highlands of West China, Buddhist frescoes from 600 years before might have staggered the Dark Age traveller with a preview of that space the West must search for. Though if Marco Polo had passed the cave city of Tun Huang, he would surely have felt the quiet of all the East had refined from the classical against the lunge of the embryonic West. So the often quoted, yet still amazing passages of Petrarch's mountain climb. Nothing but the desire to see so conspicuous a height drew me on. There is a summit higher than all the others. I stood there almost benumbed, overwhelmed by a gale of wind and the wide and open view. Clouds were gathering below my feet. The Alps were frozen stiff and covered with snow. One could see the sea and the waves that break against Aigus Mortis. The Rhone River was directly under our eyes. But these are excerpts wrenched from a frame of moral and Christian symbol on the vanity of life, the waste of years. Finally, as Augustine opened the Bible in the garden, Petrarch opens his Augustine to a page which admonishes against the climb itself. And men go to admire high mountains, oceans, stars, and do not heed themselves. Where Queen Vaidehi, imprisoned by her son, sits in meditation before a vision of the now oxidized rising sun, the whole outward realm of mild inwardness. In the foreground party, leaving Lorenzetti's 1340 town, it is the actual which is contended for, to order the phenomenal by a rule of hand and mind. 
So, in the search that would bring mathematical science out of theology and alchemy, Nicholas of Orem, about the same time, was examining the breadths of forms, how rates of change can be graphed as curvatures. No two changes whereof one is uniform or uniformly non-uniform, while the other is uniformly non-uniformly non-uniform, are to one another in a rational proportion, since one is pictured by a rectilinear and the other by a curvilinear figure. Analytical geometry and calculus lurk in that insight of the backward west. It is the human comedy of Boccaccio, the Decameron, which exemplifies Ars Nova realism. In its plots of will and wit, reality sharpens the modes of the transreal. So too in Lorenzetti's well-governed city, Boccaccio. Under guise of confession and pure conscience, a lady makes a solemn friar her go-between, he ignorant of the matter. We must not ask how an attractive wife, left on her own when her husband is out of town, can need such a stratagem. From her balcony she admires, desires. Hardly a plot of wit, if she could drop the man a note. She goes to a friar, his observed companion. Father, tell your tall acquaintance, whatever his name, to let me alone. I scorn his solicitations. The friar summons his friend. I have it from the lady, the rich merchant's wife. She can hardly stand on her balcony without your pestering her. The roused youth seeks the balcony, smiles. Back goes the lady hot foot to the friar. He has sent me this purse and girdle. Return it. I am not as he thinks. Her gift conveyed. A last move remains. Holy Father, I know not how he has learned that my husband is out of town, but last night he stole into my garden, climbed the tree to my bedroom window, so that I had to shut the casement. Either you stop him, or I tell my kinsman. Once more the priests rebuke. Rake hell, because our husband's out of town, you climb the tree to her window. Night has only to fall for the puzzle plot to be solved. As that ingenuity spreads north, it generates a fablo realism of nature under stylized devices, this Noah page from the Bedford Hours. In Chaucer's Miller's Tale, the clerk Nicholas, who sings to the Psalter, and Angelus ad virginem he sang, boards in the very house with Alison, and the carpenter husband is so much at Arsene, the two can frisk it as they please, quaint catching, holding by the haunch bones, lover, love me all at warmness. Why then that incredible device of Noah's flood, the great tubs hung in the attic for the night they all sleep there, until Nicholas and Ali soon descend for their pleasure? Why the counterplot of Absalom, jolly Clark pleading at the window, speak, sweet bird, until the hot coulter scalds Nicholas Toot? Why, but that his screaming, water, may wake the cuckold as to the biblical flood to cut loose the tub and break his leg as he crashes through the floors? But in those last works of Chaucer, Northern Gothic, having absorbed the Italian, stands on the threshold of 15th century humanization. Two phases precede that fullness, the perfection of High Gothic and the impact of Ars Nova. For High Gothic, with the close of a 1300 motet to St. Thomas of Canterbury, we range Salisbury Tower, Worcester Nave, and a scene from the Deuce Apocalypse. <laughs>
into the lilting and linear sweetness of that Ars Antiqua. Italian late Gothic unmistakably drives. We pick it up from mid-14th century in an Avignon fresco. Surely the Pope, like Chaucer's Franklin, had many a brame and many a peak in Stua, while the Amen of an English Gloria asserts the new rhythms and double leading tones. Oh, oh, oh. 